Hello, friends. Welcome to Nexus, a smart buildings technology podcast for smart humans. I'm your host, James Dice. If we haven't met before, I write a weekly newsletter on this same topic. It's also called Nexus. Each week, I share what I've learned, my opinions, and what I'm excited about in the quickly evolving world of intelligent buildings. Readers have called Nexus the best way to stay up to date on the future of this industry without all the marketing fluff. You can check it out and subscribe at nexus.substack.com or click the link in the show notes. Since starting the Nexus newsletter, many of you have reached out to me wanting to talk shop, and we have. After a few weeks of those wonderful conversations, I realized I needed to record and share them with our growing community. So here we are, the Nexus podcast is born. This is our chance to explore and learn with the brightest in our industry together. Episode 32 is a conversation with Eric Ubels, who most recently was CTO at Edge Technologies out of Amsterdam and now runs his own smart building consulting firm full time. We talk about Eric's key role in the development of the Edge building in Amsterdam, which is perhaps the most famous smart building in the entire world. And since this is the last episode of 2020, we also look forward to 2021 and dive into Eric's top three trends for our industry. All right. Hello, Eric. Welcome to the show. Thanks for taking the time. Can you introduce yourself for us? Yeah. So obviously, uh, my name is Eric Ubels. Uh, I've been in uh, smart buildings now roughly for, I would say, 10 years. Uh, I started my career in electronics, worked for Royal Phillips, uh, got involved in computer technology and then moved on to uh, working for the big uh, consulting companies. And the last 23 years uh, before I got into smart building, I worked for Deloitte. And at Deloitte, I had the opportunity also to run uh, the facilities organization, which included real estate. And in that capacity, I had this super opportunity with my team to build the building, which became the Edge building for Deloitte in Amsterdam. And that building went viral because at the time it was finished, it was considered the most sustainable and most intellectual building in the world. And yeah, that got a little bit out of hand. I think it went viral before we, uh, we could think about it, but that's what happened. And that's, of course, uh, pulled me into this whole smart building industry. Got it. Yeah, I want to dig into the edge in a little bit. Can you first talk about, you know, coming from electronics and then management consulting, and then you got into the buildings world? What was your experience coming into the buildings world and seeing how buildings get built and like trying to do something great with the edge building? Yeah, I've done a couple of buildings, but not, I mean, running the IT operation for Deloitte, uh, we were building our networks and our building access, uh, security camera technology, all of that stuff we were taking care of for Deloitte. So that's how we were involved in buildings, kind of, but never ever in the real construction, of course, or in the sustainability of the building itself. Uh, I did a couple of data centers for Deloitte which is a kind of other, you know, kind of building technology. But uh, when we got the opportunity for this building, I needed to educate myself because the real estate developer basically was claiming we're building a smart building for you. And I thought, oh, oh that's interesting, a smart building. So then I started looking at it and I, I got, you know, initially very disappointed because I thought, you know, my nest thermostat at home is probably smarter than the stuff you put in a building. Uh -huh. uh, and being a guy who loves technology uh, and always on, on the brink of new, you know, the latest and the greatest, um, you, you start to realize that the building industry is a bit behind. And I, I once was at, at one of the larger providers of building management systems in Boston, not to mention them by name, but they do, you know, building automation as well as a lot of process technology. And they basically said there's a 10 year gap between those. And, and that's what I start to realize. So learning about smart buildings and then thinking it should not only be about energy preservation and optimization, because I think for long, smart buildings were about that. And I think for me, smart buildings was about what does it actually do for the people at Deloitte at that time? How does it help me to get through the day? How does it make me more efficient? How does it take away all the barriers when I you know, go through the building, the coffee machine doesn't work, the copier doesn't work, I can't find a desk, I can't find a room. All of that stuff was much more interesting than uh, the energy saving. At that time, I was not aware of this famous JLL, uh, you know, this, uh -huh. this famous 3, 3300 ratio. 
but for whatever reason, call it pure luck, we, we've managed exactly that one, uh, the 300 ratio, the people one. Um, yeah, and then of course, uh, to finish off the question or the answer is that you got so much pushback from, you know, initially from the engineering, the real estate companies, and they all told me every single day, that's not how we do it. That's not how this industry works. It will be too expensive, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if you tell me we cannot do it, that triggers me and then we will do it. And that's what we did. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah, that's why I wanted to ask you about that, because I knew that you came in with ambitious goals for that building. And I, I knew you had told me in the past, you've met some quick resistance and yeah. just basically, you know, yeah. bulldozed through it. So that, yeah. so we'll talk about that in a minute. You, you hinted yeah. at the, the funny one about that one, just to, to mention, otherwise I forget about it, but was this whole light infrastructure. So, so these people come in and they tell me I can have this traditional fluorescent tube light infrastructure, which, you know, from Philips here in the Netherlands, super efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost as good as LED. And then I asked these people, so we want to put this in the building and the building which is ready in like three, four years from now, and you want me to put that in, I cannot explain to the young people we want to hire at Deloitte when they come into the building and they see this fluorescent tube and they kept calculating it for me. It was all too expensive and it doesn't matter. It's not about, you know, the last few pennies. Uh -huh. It's about how do you build this imagination of a super building and we need LED. And that's how I, I approached it. Yeah. Love it. Love it. So you mentioned that 10 year gap. Uh, and one of the things I like to do on this podcast is ask people why that gap exists. Yeah. So what's your answer to my favorite question, which is why is building technology behind other technology? Yeah, you know, I think there's a fundamental issue in this whole building industry. Uh, and that's in the real estate development because it's super fragmented compared to anyone else, I would say. And if I make it very flat and, and bold, uh, you know, in, and that's changed, and that's the good news. It changed rapidly uh, to the positive, but for long, the real estate developer only wants to do one thing, get the building done as quick as possible and sell it off to an investment fund and walk away. And this is basically to everybody involved. So if you're the general contractor or the engineering company, whatever, just get it over with and somebody else's problem after that, you know, the tenants or the owner's problem, whatever happens with the building. And everything is driven from cost. So it's calculated with a lot of engineering, a lot of experience, so they know what it will cost. And then the general contractors are starting to bid on the project uh, and they probably will underbid. So there's only one way to make some money or at least not to lose some money. And that's yeah. cutting costs. And that's exactly what they do. So they are going to squeeze about anyone in the process, any engineering company. And I think that has become the common way of doing business in that industry. Uh, so instead of looking, what can I buy? What technology can I invest in that actually helps me to create a better building with lower energy, lower maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. That's not how this industry is organized. Uh, it will change. And there's this famous document uh, report from the World Economic Forum, which is now about three years old. It's called the future of ACE, the architecture, construction and engineering industry. And that is super worthwhile to read for everybody in this industry because it exactly explains this whole issue about this fragmentation and that it has to change and that it has to digitalize and that there's still a huge amount of opportunities to do it better together. I don't know. Yeah, I'll have to look up that document and put it in the show notes for everyone. Um, so what do you think the number one way that this fragmentation can change? Like if that's the number one obstacle, the, the number one reason we're behind, how do we how do we get around it? Well, I, I think what's happening is that the big tenants are now demanding better buildings. So I think that's the number one driver. That's the pull from the big tenants. Then the real estate developers start to realize that if they make a real smart building, the building have a higher value. The building owners start to realize they can rent it out much better. So I think, yeah, the combination of those things uh, here in Europe specifically, there's now mandatory regulation coming in place that you have to build and a new building at least almost energy neutral. Don't ask me why it's almost, because I think that's ridiculous. It should have been completely uh, All neutral. The way. Um, and then there's this new economic stimulus fund coming in uh, because of COVID. That's actually going to push 300 billion here in Europe towards the redevelopment of existing buildings 
and to make sure they're also, you know, much better on energy performance, at least. So I think there's a lot of, you know, people who are now pulling the strings to get better buildings and to change that. Yeah. Got it. Brilliant. Okay. So let's dive into the edge and, and, I want to tell the story of, of how we met because I think it's funny. So a couple of months ago, I was developing the, the Nexus Foundations course and you signed up and I didn't know who you were. Uh, we didn't know each other at that time. And I, I looked at your LinkedIn profile when you signed up for the course and it became immediately clear that you were far more advanced of a smart building professional than I was intending for the students in the course. And so I emailed you and you said, you know, I'm, I'm just curious, just want to see what everyone's perspectives are. So I didn't think anything of it. I said, great, uh, glad to have you. And so when I was developing the week one, week one was all about, you know, let's present some high profile case studies of the smartest buildings in the world to get the students inspired for the rest of the course. And so I'm putting this together, I'm putting my PowerPoint together and I come across the edge building and I'm like, well, I have to put the edge building, let's dig into it. And so I started watching the videos and all of a sudden I'm watching the most high profile video, which we'll put in the show notes as well. And all of a sudden Eric Ubels comes up and he's being interviewed about, <laughs> about the edge building, which was just a hilarious, like full circle moment for me where here's one of my quote unquote students in the course that's now in the number one case study. Uh, so that's a funny intro to this, but I wanted to ask you why, why is the edge building so famous as we get started kind of unpacking it? Yeah. So, you know, I'm super proud of what I did and with my team and all the people who were involved. So don't get me wrong. But of course, half of it is not true. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, you, you have people who want to make nice stories in magazines and on websites and in webinars, and it becomes bigger and bigger by itself. So, mm. so the reality is, of course, a little bit different. But then again, I think it is the unique situation there was an economic downturn we were getting out of the 2008 2010 when the development started so economic downturn nobody's building new buildings so if you build a new building by definition you would get the attention from you know the architectural magazines the engineering magazines etc that one that's one part of it sustainability was a big thing here in europe there would be nobody building a non-sustainable building Mm -hmm. uh, and the real estate company that was developing it had a very good track record in building sustainable buildings. And then you have this guy called Eric Ubels, who basically got a almost like a blank check from the board. I had uh, built up a tremendous credit with my IT operation. Uh, I was asked to also run facilities. And that, of course, was the unique combination of if there's one thing for me that makes the success of a smart building, it is the the combination of real estate, facilities, IT, hospitality, all those people in one organization that basically were all reporting to me. That is, I think, for the big tenants who have this suit to build kind of office environments, that makes a difference. If these people understand that they're not building this building for themselves, but for the future employees of your company, then that makes a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge portion of it. And then the other thing is that, you know, companies like Deloitte, uh, this is true for all the big consulting, accounting, uh, law firms, banks, you know, with information workers, if you like, they always have the same issue. As soon as the economy picks up, where do we get the talent from? And that issue is becoming bigger and bigger. So without maybe 100% realizing it but that was on our radar all the time we have to make a building that will you know showcase Deloitte as a super employer uh, which they are by the way there's no no doubt about that but also with that building and that's what happened and then of course when I start thinking about this whole LED infrastructure and about sensors and IoT because I like it I said, why the hell are we not running the LED from the power over Ethernet? Mm -hmm. And if we have power over Ethernet in the fixture, why are we not adding the sensors to it? Because it makes sense. You pull one cable, you got it all integrated. It took a little bit of uh, work with Philips to get it done. Deloitte finally invested in it, and that became a huge part of the success. But it's the whole combination. And I've seen people who claim that there was this big master plan uh, I mean, that's that's just BS. There was no big master plan. It was just, you know, a couple of very 
enthusiastic, motivated people who wanted to build the best building for Deloitte. And, and that's what we did, I think. So, yeah, you talked about attracting the future professionals of Deloitte. Yeah. So that strikes me as something that even though this building was built, what, what year did it open? It was uh, delivered in 2014. Okay, so yeah. yeah, earlier in this decade. So it, it's been a bit, and so there's newer buildings obviously being yeah. built all the time. But what's something that's still relevant here is that that's, it sounds like the number one reason why this building was as smart as it was because yeah. you were trying to attract future talent. Yeah. Um, it's super interesting. And it kind of, like you said, it's, it cuts through the fragmentation in the industry when yeah. the tenant or the, the occupier is driving that intelligence. That's really Absolutely. cool. Yeah. So can you talk more about your role? So and to use the terminology in the course, we talked about a smart building champion and smart building champion is needed to be on the owner's side of things and drive the project towards yeah. intelligence, right? So how did you do that? And what was your sort of strategy behind kind of cutting through all of the ways in which we build dumb buildings? Yeah, so I, I mean, obviously you don't do this on your own. You got a team and, and I was lucky enough to have an amazing IT operation already for years, uh, very successful, super high level credit in the company. People who believed in my journeys in the future and vision, whatever you want to call it. So I was have been able and lucky to have very talented people around me. And we had a similar kind of, you know, facilities organization. So bringing those together and take them on a journey and say, we are going to make the best building ever for the people of Deloitte. That got people excited. And sometimes I told them, you know, don't do this for me. Don't do this because I'm asking you, but imagine that you and your career in the future, if you want to look for another job or whatever you want, you can say, you know what? I was part of the building. I did it. And that's how you get people excited and on the journey. And uh, we started to think about, so, what should this building actually do? And then you start thinking about, well, you know what, when I get to the building, uh, I don't want to you know, look for my card with a lot of young people, half of them lose their cards in the bars on Saturday nights in Amsterdam. So, you know, no cars. They don't lose their smartphones for whatever reason. So we want to have building access with the phone. That was not now a very common thing. You know, at that point, we were the first with HID to do that. So we wanted that. And then we want to be able to, you know, you should not be able to, to do, you know, hotel booking of a desk. It should be automatically. And you should be able to find a desk. And now they call it use cases. We use personas like in software development. We created 126 of them. Uh, and then we had to bring them down to a reasonable amount. So roughly 50 different use cases on how we want to use that building. Um, one of the first things I did when I got in charge for facilities is get us decent cappuccino machines. <laughs> uh, we just talked about that uh, before you started recording. Coffee is super important, especially here in the Netherlands. You do not start a meeting without taking a new cup of coffee. And I always had the philosophy, why do I get such lousy coffee in the office while I have this amazing machine at home, but I drink more coffee in the office. So what's, what's the logic? Uh, <laughs> so we had the opportunity you know, to buy very high-end cappuccino machines. And we talk with the vendor and the manufacturer in Switzerland and say, you have to make this machine in such a way that it will actually recognize me and that it will remember my preference. And then the guy said, well, you know what? A lot of people drink uh, cappuccino in the morning with something else in the afternoon. Yeah, what's your problem? <laughs> because you can remember that it was morning or afternoon, agree? And on top of it, we connected all those machines for the hospitality organization to monitor so that in instantly they would know there's something wrong with the machine. Wow. If you take away all of this kind of, I know, you know, in a, in a large company, when you walk to a copy machine that doesn't work, you walk to another one. Nobody's mm -hmm. going to call the service desk. Uh, this is the same if there's something wrong with the restroom. This is also true with the coffee machine. You always think somebody else will take care of it. Well, they don't. So how about we're going to make that super easy with like an app where if you're in front of the coffee machine, you say submit a complaint and that the thing does not ask you, where are you? What's the number of the machine so that you have to look on the site and figure out, no, that's you. Nice. So take away all the hurdles. So that's how we started to do it. Yeah, dreaming up more or less the capabilities of such a building. 100% wireless presentation to the, to the screens throughout the building. 
uh, 4K screens, super quality, no Creston stuff on the table. We were still using Creston, but there were no, you know, these in the meeting room, you have always this ugly black stuff with displays that never work and the cable <laughs> crutch. We did not have that. And, and that's how you create a smart building. And that's what we did. And yeah, we kept pushing and pushing the vendors. And uh, if somebody said we cannot do it, said, so, well, that's a shame that we have to find somebody else. So that's mm. how we did it. Yeah, so, I mean, you told me in the past and you mentioned earlier that you just got so much pushback. So for the other champions that are out there trying to move their projects forward, how do you, besides telling them we're going to go to a different contractor, we're going to go to a different vendor, how did you kind of like during the design and construction process sort of push through that uh, yeah. resistance? So I, I already made a remark, you know, I, I don't like people who tell me that you cannot do certain things. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, I would say in medical and in, in, in healthcare, there are things we cannot do. Uh, we all experienced that over this year, over the last year. But, you know, in everything else in life today, we can do anything we want. Uh, there's nothing that is stopping you. All the technology is there. The knowledge is there. It's a matter of time and money and guts. I mean... Elon Musk is going to Mars, uh, probably. Uh, I mean, don't tell me that we cannot do this in the building. The sensors are there. They are cheap. The electronics are there. A uh, building, it's a complicated thing to do, agree? I don't want to underestimate the effort right. and everything it takes. But at the same time, as long as there are humans on this globe, we are building. So by now, we should have a kind of idea how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, there are millions of buildings out there. It cannot be that hard. Other than I, and we discussed this, that I fully understand that the environment you're in can be a little bit hard, but I would say, don't give up, push it, uh, look for it. There's the internet. You can find just about any product out there and you just have to, you know, tickle a little bit and push it here and there, and then you can get it done. But don't, don't let anyone tell you that it cannot be done because that's basically not true. Got it. Love it. That's so inspirational because I, I think a lot of people and I've learned this through the podcast, learned this through the course and the students is that a lot of people want to be a part of a smarter building, but there's yeah. just so much resistance and you can yeah. get, you can often lose uh, momentum pretty easily. So you talked about hype for this building. Yeah. I want to ask you, what's not hype? What are you proud of on this building? Uh, so it's often considered the most sustainable yeah. building in the world as well. So can you yeah. talk about like, but beyond the occupant experience, what's not hype that you're proud of? Yeah, so what is not hype, the building is super sustainable. It has shown uh, with the data over the last couple of years that it's even more sustainable than it was built for. So energy consumption, uh, especially electricity, I only know the numbers from the first three years, but in the first three years, it never got above 50% of the expected energy consumption, which That's is cool. amazing. Yeah. So yes, sustainability, super. Uh, then the whole experience of being in the building, enjoying, um, for those who have never seen it, but it has a huge atrium. So the architect, uh, PLP out of London, Ron Bakker, came up with this huge atrium that people typically don't like uh, when they build real estate. <laughs> but this makes that, imagine you're working for a Deloitte, which is a very large company with a lot of young people. And you are, you know, going to a traditional building and you'll go to the 26th floor, you can be all day long on that floor and you have no clue what's going on, who's in the building. You don't be part of a live system. Right. Uh, because of this, in the edge you are, you can see people, you see people working. Uh, you may even see your manager or your peers without even talking to them actually that day, but at least you know, ah, they're here, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you, you start looking for each other because of that. So that living part of the story is super. The daylight experience in that building is just beyond anything else. I haven't seen anything yet that comes close. Uh, wow. And daylight is a super important part of uh, your building experience, your health and well-being. The whole soundscaping of the building I have done like thousands of tours in the building and every time people told me, how is it possible that such large open space is so quiet? Uh, of course, that has been designed into it, uh, especially with the ceiling, the digital climate ceiling technology uh, we were using, which is like six times more expensive than traditional heating and cooling and ceiling system, but it, it paid off because of, of that. Then, of course, the integration of the sensors and the light, because the sensors are so fundamental 
to tell you exactly how the space is being used at what times of the day, where people are crowded or not, that allowed Deloitte to put so much more people on the same space. When the economy came back, they started to hire much more people than uh, than we expected. Mm. Uh, so, you know, from that perspective, it's also, you know, pure on the, on the business case, a much better building than they ever expected. So that's perfect. All the features... You know, I'm a little bit of an autistic guy, to be honest. So to give you an example, all the monitors on the desk, every desk had a big monitor. The color of the monitor is white. You say, what's so special about it? Well, it's specially made white. It's Deloitte house style white. It's not just white. So Deloitte at that time, I still have the same three basic colors, which is white, blue, and green in their house style. Yeah. So everything in that building is in that color. So if you have a locker, obviously, which you can control with your smartphone and you can put your clothes in there or, or some of your stuff, then typically such a locker would have a red LED for being blocked or green for being free. Well, not a Deloitte. It's blue and green. It's Deloitte blue and green. Uh, and this is true. The cables on the keyboards, on the cables, everything is in the same color. And you say, why is this important? Well, I can honestly tell you, when you walk into a building and everything is in that style, it creates a kind of, I call it, quietness in your eyes. Mm -hmm. You don't have a lot of holes in the ceiling. If you have a traditional ceiling, there's so many different things that are popping up in the ceiling. Uh, sensors, air, air in and out, you know, you don't have that. It's just the light infrastructure and there's a little sensor in the infrastructure. It, in one way or the other, it makes you less fatigued and it creates this very quiet environment. So mm. all of that, that's not hyped. The coffee is not hyped. You know, the visual systems are not hyped. The app is a bit overhyped, to be honest with you. Not a huge success, um, not because of the app, but we were one of the first to apply an end user app. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I make mistakes as well, and that's worthwhile to learn. Um, at that time, there was still a lot of debate whether Microsoft would create a Windows phone or not. Our people obviously wanted an iPhone for sure. Uh, and we were building a multi-tenant building, so we would not know what kind of phone do the other tenants use. So will they have you know, Android or iPhones or Windows phones or whatever? So we need to make a system that is universal and will work on all those different platforms. It needs to work on tablets. It needs to work on a PC, on a Mac. So we decided to build it 100% web-based. Well, that's a huge mistake. People don't want a web-based solution on their iPhone, they want an app. They want uh, a dedicated app, yeah. And, uh, that's one part. So now, obviously, that company, which is uh, quite successful, uh, MapIQ out of the Netherlands, has built an amazing app that can control all the different things in the building, can do wayfinding, room booking, et cetera, et cetera. But we did not have the localization technology. At that time, Philips told us they did not believe that Bluetooth became so big as it was, or as now is, can you imagine? Uh, now right. everybody understands it. But what that, do you mean by localization technology? Like That means that basically your phone knows where you are. Locating people. Because then you can, of course, provide the services related to where you are. Got it. Uh, so you don't have to check into your desk. If you want to control the light and the temperature, which the building does, mm -hmm. then one way or the other, if you pick up your phone to do so, that phone needs to know which light do I want to control. Right. Uh, so you use Bluetooth to localize your phone uh, and tell your phone or the app specifically where you are. This is also true when you want to open doors automatically. Uh, you know, when you get closer to the door, it gets unlocked because on who you are based on your authorization. Obviously, it needs to know who you are and where you are. So that's fundamental. But And that's now very commonplace in modern buildings. Mm -hmm. But we did not have that. So that was a bit of a, of a challenge. Yeah, so I mean, there's certain things that didn't work. Um, I can honestly tell you, even if you have a building app, but there are features that you can do without the app, people will not use the app. So okay. you, you can order a coffee through an app and it can recognize, but you have to walk to the coffee machine anyway. So uh, touch the big display and say, I want a cappuccino. I mean, that's as easy as a phone, agree? So it doesn't yeah. matter. So, so yeah, you learned a lot of those things. And uh, it, okay. it's an amazing building. I'm still super proud. It's you know, I get seven, eight requests a day from out of the world of people who want to talk to me about this building. That's, that's absolutely still fantastic. 
And to be honest with you, in my current experience, it is still hard to convince people to do similar stuff. While this building has now uh, been in operations for six years. Mm -hmm. So, hey, this industry is not always moving as fast as uh, some others. So still a lot of opportunity also, that's the good news. Tons of opportunity, yeah. So you mentioned Microsoft and I don't wanna key in on the phone thing, obviously we know how that turned out, but you told me previously that this was built, all these solutions were built on Microsoft IoT infrastructure. Yeah. And so this was long before, so two episodes ago, we had Matt Vogel on, on the show. He talked about today's yeah. Microsoft IoT infrastructure and the Azure Digital Twins. So back then, though, this was sort of just like a Apple and Microsoft's eye. So talk about how you use Microsoft on that project and then how you've seen yeah. that progress, that solution progress and why you're, if, I'm assuming yeah. you're excited about it. Why are you excited about what Microsoft yeah. is doing today? So obviously one of the, the whole ideas about that building is that we would have one view on all the data of the building. So obviously working within a large company, you have these silos, I was running IT, super integrated, completely on Microsoft technology. And then we had our facilities organization, uh, different tools. I don't like that. I <laughs> want to have the data in one place and being able to say, hey, tell me what's going on in the company uh, and, and especially on, on those assets. So we wanted to pull all of that stuff together. And at that time, even though we were using cloud computing, uh, our security people were not too happy to put this building uh on the internet that way i would have done it uh, i'm a little bit more brave um, on that but uh, so we we decided to build a platform ourselves this was in 2010 when we started so we basically connected all the different pieces of technology and we were using all of the traditional components like microsoft sql server uh, microsoft web services early microsoft iot capabilities just just like the lego box uh, microsoft provides but it was not a hundred percent cloud-based solution. Uh, obviously, that, that is a huge thing right now. Interesting thing, when we started to do this, Microsoft learned about it and they came to help us to actually educate us. So Matthew Fogel, I almost, almost, I know Matthew and Matt and all of those guys. Yeah, they have been of super help to us to actually make it happen. Uh, and also to drive it all to this, this common uh, Microsoft platform, which we were using at the time. And I also felt already that, that Microsoft would be a huge party in this whole smart building industry. I'm, I'm a Microsoft adept. I never make a secret out of that. I have a relationship with them for over 30 years. Uh, and, and I like those guys for a whole bunch of different reasons. But I think it's fundamental to understand that even people not, may not realize it, but in the embedded industry, so whether you're in machinery or in healthcare equipment or in just about anything, there's Microsoft Insight. Uh, you may not realize that. So you can almost dream up that if the world is moving to IoT, which is you know happening, of course, big time already at that time, you could just understand that whether you like them or not, they will be all over the place. They got an ecosystem around the world. They got developers. And, and that's how, how industry typically works. They're not going to do crazy things. They will evolve uh, in that area. That was a huge important thing uh, at that time to me. Uh, on top of it, you, you know that some of the big building automation, building management system manufacturers are close with Microsoft, some of the elevated guys. So you could almost kind of see that that would come together at a certain point with the break of IoT at that moment. And now with digital twin, happening big time yeah hmm. yeah this is an interesting uh so the, the podcast episode after you will be about the whole it versus ot situation yeah. and i think it's interesting to get your perspective on it so do you think there should be two separate types no. of technology or you think it all should be one it sounds like it's one and at the edge we built one i integrated or converged network as they call it mm -hmm. uh, i would not have it anyway else even though obviously we also had at that time already discussion with some of those people. Uh, the philosophy is most of the time that they want to separate the network because the security difference between those environments. Uh, a lot of people say we don't trust the building uh, security uh, or the IP backbone or the guys uh, running the building security. Well, if that's the case, I would definitely go after it and take care of it. That's one part of the story. 
Uh, the other part is that if you do trust your corporate IT environment and what these guys are doing for you, then I definitely would put the building behind it because then it would be equally secure with the same tools. That's one reason. The other one is if you really think about sustainability, that's not just about energy or a smart building is not just about providing services to people. It's also about the fundamental drive to lower the amount of material we are consuming as people. So less copper, less, less electronics, less metal, less material. Uh, an IP backbone in a building with all respect, that is such a small thing compared to a corporate IP backbone in size and capabilities that any corporate IP backbone you would put in a building can easily also do on top of it, the smart building part of it. So if you split them, you have to build the infrastructure twice. You have to buy the switches twice, everything else twice, which will be consuming energy. You will replace them at a certain point of time. And I find that very hard to explain because there's technology wise, no reason you can separate this traffic very easily on the network nowadays. So I would put it all together, uh, but that's put you more, uh, a little bit of a longer term story. And now I'm going to say something very different, difficult and dangerous, but this botnet stuff will go away and it will take 40 years, but there's no logic in the longer run. It will all be 100% IP enabled and native IP, period. Yeah. And of course, for backwards compatibility, we are gluing all of this stuff together and packing it and make it difficult. But in the long run, it's going to be 100% IP enabled. What we now have in hardware in buildings will, will change into software mostly. Uh, obviously, you've seen this in controls and VAVs and uh, chillers. There's a lot of electronics already. There's a lot of software and that will move on and move forward. IP is just cheaper at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So that will be a, a big driver. Uh, and at a certain point in time, you know, the whole software, the building management system is nothing else than a piece of software uh, connecting and directly talking to a lot of IP enabled devices. Hence, you're basically... Uh, to what the IP or the corporate IP network already does today. So yeah, I'm so, sure a lot of people don't agree with me, but that's fine. I mean, well, so this is, that's the fascinating piece is that yeah. you have strong opinions here and then others, the people yeah. that, some people yeah. that are listening to this right now have other yeah. like diverging opinions. Yeah. So whenever I find those things, I like to dig into them. So people can, that are listening to this can expect me yeah. to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole yeah. uh, in, the, in 2021 on this. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Thank you for that perspectives yeah. before we move on from the edge though so i understand that, that the edge has turned into a development company as well and i, I don't really understand how this works no, 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 also no. now into a software company as well yeah so, no that's a that? bit of a different story uh, that okay. might be confusing well everything is edge right now edge devices edge yeah computers. yeah it's edge uh well first of all that building was called edge period uh. Then there was this uh, real estate developer who actually developed the Edge building on behalf of Deloitte, together with Deloitte, mm -hmm. uh, was an existing real estate company, uh, which had a very good track record in making sustainable buildings. And mm -hmm. therefore they built a, developed a couple of buildings with Deloitte. Then with the Edge, even though there was a lot of pushback initially, obviously when the building was sold off much better than anyone expected at a certain point in time, uh, the company, the real estate developer, did also realize that they should not only make sustainable buildings, but also smart, intelligent buildings. Okay. So then at a certain point, they hired me and I joined them to actually develop a smart building platform, smart buildings, as well as a smart building platform uh, that would come along with their own real estate developments initially. But they also decided later to make that platform available just basically for any building. So very much like any other, you know, smart building provider has the ability to do this for brand new buildings or existing development. And they changed the name to Edge Technologies. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there was such a huge, you know, advertising, uh, yeah. free marketing, what, what do you want to call? So it would almost be silly not to use that. Yeah. Uh, and that's what they did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they just announced, I think this past fall, that that software is available to anyone that wants to use it, yeah. which is super interesting. Yeah. Cool. So let's uh, let's shift. I want to ask you about, okay, 
given your you're, you're now fully into the smart buildings world yeah. so before you were just kind of like uh, an entrant and you know how can we figure this industry out and make yeah. it more intelligent now you're in it so when you think about we're kind of in this transition 2020 to 2021 I want to ask you about sort of forward-looking trends because I, I, I want to hear what you think. So let, let's start. So you provided three three big trends for me. Uh, so let's start with, and, and this kind of goes along with what we were just talking about. Let's start with the human-centric design. Yeah. So if, if you think about the past, a smart building was like a BMS or uh, you know, getting into maybe doing some analytics, right. and analyzing data. And so now we have this trend towards designing buildings with the human in mind, designing buildings with the tenant in mind, designing buildings with the future Deloitte employee in mind, right? Like you said. Yeah. So how are you seeing that changing right now and in 2021? Yeah, I, I think we now see this happening big time, almost unfortunately boosted by COVID. But mm -hmm. the whole realization that, they, first of all, we build buildings for people at the end of the day period. Yeah. Uh, they have to live there, work there, go there, whatever they want to do. So that's the number one reason. Second of all, all of the large companies, whatever the economy does at the moment, in the longer run, we will ru run out of young, talented people to do all the work we need to do. So this fight for talent, this war on talent, as they call it in the US, I think will come back, it will become huge. So you have to provide a very nice environment to work, even though you may work a lot from home, and you still need to go to the office now and then. And the office will not be a traditional office. It will be, I always imagined it would be like a super Starbucks um, <laughs> where you meet with people and customers and you may super have- Super Starbucks, okay. Yeah, and so they have to provide it to be attractive and, and to you know find talent. That's, that's a huge thing. On top of it, people start to realize that the building, if you spend so much time inside, that this really hurts if you're not in a good quality building your health and well-being, your energy level, your creativity. We always made this nice comparison. If you're in a bad meeting room, your CO2 level, you know, in, in just like an hour or two can go up to 1200 or 1400 PPM. That's exactly the same as consuming three glasses of wine, uh, which basically means at the end of the meeting, when you make decisions, you were all drunk. So, I mean, that's not a good situation we're in other than that you get fatigue and that, that you don't have energy anymore and for whatever. But so I think this whole health and well-being is super important. Now with COVID, we have to prove to people that the building is safe and secure. I don't think that will, that will go away. So it's not just temperature, uh, humidity, CO2 level, but it's air particles, it's VOC, it's noise, it's daylight. All of these things uh, you now have to more or less prove in a building. And that's only that you know, the technical air quality kind of thing, if you if you like, but obviously also the whole environment from, you know, living room kind of meeting rooms instead of the traditional setup mm -hmm. uh, that you feel more relaxed if you talk to people. Different kind of choices you need to have uh, depending on the task you have at hand. They call it uh, activity-based working or there are all kinds of fancy names for it. Yeah. But, but basically it means you go to the office and whatever you need to do, there's an environment that best fits that activity. And that can be, you know, an open desk where you have a couple of people and you can chat a little bit now and then with your colleagues. It can be a, a single phone booth where you have very concentrated phone call. <laughs> Equally, you could have something like a video conferencing, a larger groups, a coffee. Uh, I mean, all kinds of different settings to actually optimize that. And, and this is not only true for, for the meeting space in the area, but also the food you will get. Do you have like a fitness area? All of that stuff actually would contribute uh, to make a, make a super building. Yeah. Got it. All right. Um, I love that. And I don't think that one is going to surprise a lot of people given the pandemic and like where we're at right now in the industry. This next one might surprise a couple of people. So you talked about uh, full IP enablement. We talked about it a little yeah. bit earlier. And yeah. with that, going away from DDC to more IP enabled, you call them integrated controllers. Yeah. And I thought this was funny because this there's a LinkedIn discussion that happened this week where Rob hunting in from Australia, he said, the sun is setting on BMS as we know it and change is coming through building operating systems and packaged equipment control, which is I think what you mean by integrated controls. 
which when delivered together will eliminate the need for field fitted BMS control altogether. So I think that's kind of the same thing you're talking yep. about here, which is super interesting to me. I'm actually writing a piece about this right yep. now. Where, what are you seeing in this area and, and what do you think it means for disruption uh, of maybe the, the big controls companies? Yeah, I, I mean, I know that some of these big control companies are actually working on this technology. So I don't think there, there will be other players, but also the traditional ones will be there for sure. So I'm not too worried about that. But for me, it makes a lot of sense. Why, why would you buy a DDC is basically a PLC, uh, which exists for 40 years. It's a bunch of IOs, digital, analog, a couple of, of protocols, whatever. And then you have to specifically program this thing to do whatever you want it to do. Well, a building is a very specific thing. You want to manage temperature, uh, light, the blinds. So why would I need to take this big universal, which, which has a huge capability, don't get me wrong. Right. And in the industry, there's a lot of reason why you want to buy it. But in a building, you can almost dream up what you want to do. So you can create this at much lower cost, much less programming. And what I did not say, but we're really talking about, you know, running out of talent in the future. This is, this is true for anyone in the world. So even deploying and commissioning this as a building, which now takes quite an amount of labor and programming and specific knowledge, that is also a reason why it has to go to a easier a much easier solution. And that's what this integrated technology proves to do. It will be lower cost because even if you buy the DDCs, every time you buy too much, basically it has too much IOs and stuff in one place. So you can reduce the amount of electronics, which is good for you know, waste and, and that kind of thing that obviously relates to cost then it will do exactly what you want to do. It does control light. It allows you to do temperature, humidity, drive the VFVs, the blinds, whatever you have in a room in a much simpler way. It does 100% IP enabled. It integrates localization like Bluetooth, Zigbee, whatever it integrates. So there's a lot of reasons to believe that that is happening. And yeah, there are some examples in the industry now. I did not know about this, uh, this article or discussion we're referring to. I would love to see it. And I, I don't think it will happen for a lot of good reasons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll send you, I'll put a and link you know to the what? show notes and send you if a link to it. If it's not true, then it will still prevail because it's lower cost. So hmm. okay. I mean, I've already seen calculations from Snyder. Uh, Snyder provides this. I'm sure the others are doing this as well. Uh, if you compare it one-to-one, -one, so you would lay out exactly the same building and you go for DCC or integrated, you will see that integrated is lower cost. So yeah, it'll happen on its own. Yeah, I've always said that I think the opportunity that I see for this is that today's BMS is terrible at supervisory control. And I've written yeah. a ton of essays on this. It's just, if you, if you walk into the average building, there's a ton of opportunity around doing that layer better. Yeah. And so what I'm seeing is like, there's these overlay platforms, software platforms yeah. that can take on that responsibility, yeah. cut it out of the BMS layers, right? And then, okay, if that yeah. layer is cut out and then yeah. you're, what you're talking about is the edge controllers, that yeah. those being done differently, well, then yeah. we start to have a different BMS yeah. altogether, so. Yeah, and a lot of that capability will actually be driven to the edge devices uh, because you don't need to push all the data from all the sensors directly into your cloud environment. That, that's a little bit unnecessary. So there will be a lot happening on the devices. These edge devices become smarter and better. So they will also run some of the AI you need in a building. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's a very logical evolution in my opinion. All right, let's transition to, to number three. This relates to what we were just talking about. So you said a, a pure software layer, right? So pure intelligent building management platform, as you called it, basically an overlay sitting on top of all this, right? And some people call this a digital twin. There's a little bit of confusion around. So what are you seeing in this area? Yeah, I mean, if there's one person who believes in digital twin, then for sure that's me. I think without realizing it, but after realizing the edge and talking to to Microsoft, the team with Pat van Hoven, and Matthew Vogel, those guys started this this smart spaces development, which is now their digital twin. I think a digital twin is fundamental to just about any industry or anything you want to do uh, with IoT. So it's a logical consequence of IoT. 
not very well understood. And like any new technology in any industry, overhyped by a lot of people. <laughs> that means if you would go to, well, we cannot go to a trade show, but one of the last trade shows I was, was an IoT Congress in the Barcelona. And suddenly everybody has a digital twin right. just because it's a marketing hype. So that's of course not true. So I honestly believe for whoever listens to this, make sure you understand the fundamental difference between a real digital twin and a marketing hype. And a digital twin is not a 3D design of your building on the screen that you can you know, play with with your mouse very useful, but not, and then have the data plotted on a traditional building management system and database onto that screen. That's not a digital twin, but that's 99% what you see out there right. at the moment. Right. A digital twin is about modeling your building. So you use a descriptive language to basically explain how your building uh, looks like, how it's built up. And then it allows you, or basically knows to give you an example, if you look at a floor plan of a building and you see on that design, the temperature, the humidity, the CO2, the number of people in the room, we as human beings know that that's all related to the same room. So we immediately in our brains, we know that it's connected to each other. Mm -hmm. A real digital twin allows you to associate, if you like, for another better word, but that knows that these things belong to each other, that they all belong to the room. So they're not individual data points taken from a traditional database, but they belong to each other. Therefore, you can also apply methods to it. You can query that kind of data. And that is fundamental in the longer run to allow machine learning and AI to be applied to it. So yeah, again, Microsoft does others out there, but Microsoft is doing an amazing job in this space together with, uh, with a company called Willow in Australia. There's a couple of others out there, but they are doing an amazing job to, to bring this to the marketplace. And if you don't understand, you know, check it out and make sure you understand Digital Twin. On top of it, just beyond smart buildings, this is identified as one of the top 10 technologies in the next decade or in this decade. So there's uh, autonomic cars, there's uh, machine learning, there's AI, and then there's digital twins. So it will be huge throughout just any industry. Mm -hmm. and this is something that it's just so hard to cut through the hype in this industry on this. What do you think is the key to educating building owners on the value of digital twins? Yeah, I think the digital twin on itself is, is a little bit hard to explain, especially if you're not in, into it. I would say, you know, at least you need to understand that's pretty fundamental to get it right for whatever you want to do in the future with the buildings. Obviously, people are much more looking into, I need to manage my energy or my space or my health and well-being, and that's driving their, their concern. But I would say that make yourself known a little bit about digital twin. You don't have to be an expert. Uh, but at least try to figure out what's the difference between marketing hype and real and choose whatever product you can find that actually does use a digital twin behind it because it's so fundamental for whatever you will do. And, you know, if you buy an energy management platform or space optimization, whatever, you don't buy those things every week. So typically, you know, you, you buy it and you have like three, five or sometimes eight years go along with that kind of technology. So you better make sure you, you buy the right thing. Totally. Yeah, I think you covered it well. It's it's just like we have to get past the hype as an industry yeah. and get into what it actually is. And I feel like we're, yeah, I'm a part of so many panels and so many discussions around just like clarifying myths or busting yeah. myths, clarifying what it is. And like maybe in 2021, we as an industry can just like get past that piece and get into like actual case yeah. studies. Because I think that the struggle with building owners is with a digital twin that we're realizing the value is kind of also realizing a different way to do business, right? right? So whatever business you're in, whether it's commercial real estate or you're a hospital or you're a school district, there's a different way to run your organization yes. that a digital twin enables. Yeah. And until we get to that piece, that realization, I, I yeah. think they're always going to like limit the value, consider it sort of a point solution or just like not get it. Yeah. And so we have to get over that hump and I'll try to do my yeah. best to get us there. I, I mean, th this whole digital twin is fundamental to be able to pull all of those different data sources together. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can theoretically do this in a traditional technology, but this is fundamental. Then it is a, it's a layer that allows you to 
as I call it associated, probably, you know, one of the guys at Microsoft is going to kill me over it because I haven't found another better word for it. But just the fact that this system is able to understand itself, how it relates to all those different other pieces, that is the fundamental difference, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And on top of this, at the end, we all want to have this single pane of truth. We want to look at this screen and know what's going on in all those different systems. And the digital twin plays a very important role into that. Yeah, so we cannot express enough how important it is. Awesome. All right, Eric, thanks so much for your time. This has been, this has been really fun. It was fun. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you so much. All right, friends. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nexus Podcast. For more episodes like this and to get the weekly Nexus newsletter, please subscribe at nexus.substack.com. You can find show notes for this conversation there as well. As always, please reach out on LinkedIn with any thoughts on this episode. I'd love to hear from you. Have a great day.